Good evening and welcome everyone. And of course, Happy New Year's. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Shamti Lopes Toro, and I am the Assistant Director for Engagement and Communications for the Education Trust in Massachusetts. And I am delighted to join the Massing Polling Group in sharing new data on the experiences of parents and families in K-12 schools throughout Massachusetts. At the Education Trust, we are committed to working alongside educators, parents, students, and policymakers to transform schools and colleges into institutions that serve all students well. At this particular, as Massachusetts finds itself in this in a particularly complex juncture, we are grateful for the opportunity to continue and deepen our impacts by uplifting the voices of families. In, our, in November and December of 2022, the Massing Polling Group held two focus groups of racially and geographically diverse K-12 parents across Massachusetts. Those focus groups were an opportunity not only to hear directly from parents, from parents on their experiences and their perspective, but also help to shape our most recent poll. Following these two focus groups, the Massing Polling Group used the valuable feedback we received um, to really help inform this parent poll, asking parents how their child was doing academically, mentally, and emotionally, what supports and resources they were receiving from their schools, and looking ahead to their child's future needs. This current survey is the seventh in a series of polls that go back to October 2020. The longevity of this poll really allows us to reflect on parents' experiences over the last three years and review trends where we see in the data. After this presentation of the results, we will hear from a parent uh, panel who also participated in the focus groups and had a chance to review the statewide survey results. They will both reflect on their own experiences as well as what they saw in the data. Please feel free to use the Q&A function in this Zoom to submit your questions. Your questions will be answered at the end during the Q&A portion. But before we jump in, I wanted to let you know that the recording, slides, and data will be available on the Mass Inc group's website, as well as the Education Trust in Massachusetts following tonight's event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Steve Coxella, president of Massing Polling Group, who will share the results from the statewide survey. Steve, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> the introduction and thank you to all of those <clears throat> of you who are taking time out of your evening to join us today. I'm Steve Cazella. I'm the president of the Massing Polling Group. Um, we're a, a polling firm in the typically in normal times located on Beacon Hill right here in Boston. Um, we also have uh, staff elsewhere across the Commonwealth and even across the country at this point. So um, but what, we're, what I'm here to talk about tonight is a survey that we conducted recently of K-12 of, uh, K parents across, across the Commonwealth. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, share a set of slides that we've created, which show <clears throat> the highlights of the poll that that um, that we recently concluded. So <clears throat> as Shanti said during the introduction, this is the seventh now in a series of surveys that we've conducted going all the way back to the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, each of the ones, each of the surveys have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 parents of school age kids across Massachusetts. And what makes the survey particularly unique and compelling is that each one of them also includes oversamples of Black, Latino, and Asian parents in Massachusetts. So as you'll see on some of the slides, we were able to break out results in a more fine-grained way than would be typically available if we had just done an overall representative sample of parents as a whole. Um, this particular wave was conducted in November and December. Interviewing was in English and Spanish. Um, and you can think of this data as being representative demographically of parents as a whole. Um, and we also need to give a huge shout out to uh, the Education Trust and also the Bar Foundation for um, their support and commitment in continuing to make these sur surveys happen. Um, I'm actually, there are key finding slides, which will be on the version posted on our website if you'd like to go and kind of see what we think was important about the data or pass along these slides. I'm going to skip over them at this point just because we're going to dive right into the findings that they all cover. Uh, but please do feel free to go to our, set, our website at massingpolling.com and take a look at the slides in more detail. 
So then looking, starting to look at some of the numbers, this very first slide here, the question that we asked, which for each of the slides, the questions are shown here at the bottom. The question for this one was overall, how would you grade your child's school? And it says grade level because for parents who had more than one child um, in school, we would specify, you know, how would you grade your second grader, second grade child's school and that sort of thing. Um, and what you can see is that overall, 81% give their child schools A's or B's. So pretty good marks, pretty high marks. This isn't necessarily unusual in education polling. Um, going back quite a long ways, we tend to see the pattern where parents give their own child school the best grades, local schools the next best, state schools across the state the next best, and nationwide the worst. Um, and that's kind of been a stable pattern in education polling for quite a while. So overall, pretty high grades. We also then wanted to kind of understand what went into this, you know, what factors are, are parents thinking about the most? So, and how would they grade those factors? So we also then asked uh, A through F on a series of other items. Um, and what, and you can see those items listed here on the side of the chart. <clears throat> And the red bars that you're seeing are um, the percent of parents who offered the, a grade of an A or a B to the school in each one of these different factors. So for instance, how would you grade your, the school on making sure all students feel welcome and like they belong in school? 77% of parents would give that item an A for their own child's school. Um, you can see that overall, a majority of parents gave A's or B's on all, on pretty much all of the items. One at the bottom, hiring teacher, hiring and keeping teachers of color. There's a little more explanation, which we'll dig into on the next slide. Um, but overall, what to take from this is grades are pre grades are pretty good. I'm pretty good overall. Um, there's another one here to kind of take note of and keep in the back of your mind, which is making sure all students who need help with their mental health get it. That's another one which we'll dig into in a little bit. But why is this one down here with only 49%? Um, well, it turns out that a lot of parents actually said, I don't know to this question. So this doesn't necessarily, this does not um, suggest that parents gave a lot of low grades. But what we see on the next slide, which shows the same question we were just looking at, is that overall 49% gave hiring and, and keeping teachers of color an A, 26% gave it a C through, or A or B, I should say, 26% said C through F, and then about a quarter said, I don't know, to that question, which was much higher than it was for any of the other grades um, <clears throat> on the previous slide. Um, and that was a, that number was particularly high among white parents. So this is one place where we were able to break out the data. And you can see that among white parents, 44% gave an A or a B. But the number that really sticks out is that, that the highest number um, uh, that, that uh, <clears throat> among white parents, 30% said, I don't know, which is much higher than it was for parents of color. Um, but overall here too, you've got um, Latino and Asian parents where with over 60% offering an A or B um, and black parents were the most likely to offer a C through F on this particular item. Okay, so that's just a very, very quick glance at how schools are doing. Let's look at how parents think their children are doing in school. <clears throat> so this is a question we've been asking going back to the beginning of the pandemic. And the question was, is basically, it's it's two question, two a pair of questions. Prior to the coronavirus crisis, do you think your child's academics were at, behind, or ahead of grade level? And then the follow-up question is, how about now? Um, and you can see that uh, at this point, we've got 24% saying that they think that their child's academics are behind grade level. And you can see sort of how that's trended over time, going back to begin the beginning and even before the pandemic, when only 13% saw their child's academics as behind grade level. Ahead of grade level, that's this pink one here, you can see has gone from 28% before the pandemic to 18% today. And then at grade level is this one up here, which is kind of in the mid to high 50s, roughly. Um, so what I take from this is that mostly over the last three waves, things have kind of leveled out with rough with somewhere in the low to mid 20s saying that they're um, they think that their child is now behind grade level at this point. <clears throat> Keep this group in your mind because we actually dig into them a little bit a little bit more in some of the other slides that are coming up. This 24 percent, we think that their child's academics are currently behind grade level. So then this is the same question looked at another way, which was, which is how do you, whether you think your child is currently behind at or ahead of grade level. And what it shows is 
the familiar numbers, 24% say behind, but then we also broke it out by a bunch of different demographic groups within the survey. So for instance, um, parents of children with an IEP, for instance, among that group, 37% thought that their child was behind grade level, which was the highest of any of the different uh, demographic groups that we measured in the survey. I should say that, that there's even more detail on this than every other question in the cross tabs, which are also posted on our website. So if you're interested in digging in on any of the items that, are, that we're talking about today, all of that information is on our website. The other, a couple other groups that are worth pointing out, we see um, among parents with incomes under 50,000, household incomes under 50,000, it's a little bit higher at 29%. And among white parents, we see 26%, um, while, while Asian parents, just 9% say they believe their child is currently behind grade level. <clears throat> So that group is worth kind of looking at a little bit, um, a little bit more, and we do on a couple of the slides that are coming up. Um, we also look at them here, where we basically crossed two of the questions that we've already looked at. <clears throat> the question of whether you think your child is ahead at or behind grade level, and then how you would grade your child's school overall. So the way to read this is basically, among parents who think their child is ahead of grade level, 57% of those parents gave their child an A, or I'm sorry, gave this, their child's school an A. 31% gave a B, and you can see C through F is just 12%. Then you look at parents who think their child is at grade level, it's 45% offer A's. And then behind grade level, we get, we're, we're down to just 19% um, <clears throat> and 45% of B and, and uh, many more saying C to F than, than other parents. Um, this is reflected also in all of the individual school, um, all the individual items that we looked at where there's different, where we sort of broke out uh, grading on different factors. You see basically the same pattern show up on all of them. It, um, it's a very busy slide to try to make, so it, we didn't show it here, but um, you can basically just, just think or, or know that um, <clears throat> this is reflected in other grades as well. So as Shanti said at the beginning, we also did some focus groups to prepare for these. And we've got some, we pulled some quotes that were particularly um, poignant or pertinent to, um, to some of the factors that, we, that we're discussing in the poll. Um, so we were just talking about whether parents think their child is, is ahead or behind and how the schools are doing and so forth. Um, and, and you can see there, there are just a couple examples of the kinds of things that, um, that parents said. So for example, I'll just read one. I feel that there was quite a bit of a setback in the learning process for many kids. I feel lucky perhaps that my kids don't exhibit that, but I'm really concerned about many, many parents and many kids out there who are really struggling and trying very hard to catch up. Um, so looking actually a bit deeper at that issue, we then asked parents, overall, do you think more students are behind grade level in your child's school compared to before COVID, more or ahead, or are things about the same as before COVID? And interestingly, we found just 46% say more are now behind. So you, you kind of pair this with what we've seen recently from it, various different official sources, whether it's MCAS data or NAEP data or any of the other kinds of metrics that we've seen of academic um, progress just in the last you know, few months. And um, you, know, you can uh, contrast that then with what parents are saying where only 46% think that more children are currently behind. There's also some interesting demographic um, breakdowns on this where upper income parents are actually more likely to say they think more children are behind at their kids' school. White parents are also more likely than our parents of color to say the same. Um, so there may be a bit of a disconnect overall between what parents uh, believe about uh, where students are performing at their kids' school and what the data shows. Um, and that's one of the things that we dug into a little bit more as we work our way through the poll. I should also say that this is not unique to Massachusetts. Um, the next slide has a chart that we just we pulled from another poll, which is why it looks completely different. Um, this one is from a poll done by Morning Consult, Ned Choice, nationally. Um, and the question that they asked was, compared to the last national standardized academic test in 2019, how do you think your state um, performed this time in 2022? And you can see that among school parents, more actually thought that um, test scores had gone up since 2020. 19 than the percent of parents who thought they'd gone down. Um, so kind of the understanding of the scope of the crisis 
and uh, you know parents' level of understanding, both in Massachusetts and nationwide, is um, is what these last two two charts really show. So then we asked the question, basically, how much effort is the school currently putting in? How much extra effort are they currently putting in? And we see that most parents think that um, schools are putting in at least a fair amount of extra effort to help students catch up from COVID-19. We see 43% saying a fair amount, 22% saying a great deal. So most think that there's at least a fair amount of effort being put into um, to catching up after COVID. Also a part of that, we asked, do you think that the, um, that the school has enough academic resources to help students and 73% to help students who need it? 73% thought yes, eight out of 10 among those parents, thinking back to that question about whether a child's ahead or at grade level or behind, 80% um, of the first two groups thought that uh, their schools had enough resources. But looking at the at parents who think their child is currently behind grade level, there we saw just 56% thought the same. So this is a group that stands out in a couple of different ways. Um, we've seen a couple of them already, and we'll see a few more as, as we continue through the slides. So then one of the questions is, okay, well, what if there were supports available? What if more programming was available? How likely would you actually be to send, to send your child to take advantage of it? And that's what this next table examines. So we asked basically the likelihood, Very, would you be very likely, somewhat likely, not to or not at all likely if your school were, were to offer optional and then fill in the blank with any of these items. Um, so the thing that the most parents said very likely to was small group tutoring during school hours. That one, 38% of parents said that they would be very likely to send their child. Um, after school tutoring was another one. Um, and then you kind of look, can look down and see that the, the numbers go down from there to 11% who said very likely for, for school during vacation weeks. Um, we saw, though, that more students with IEPs, um, more, more ELL students also, also said that they were, uh, or I'm sorry, parents of students with IEPs and parents of, of um, students who are ELL uh, said that they would be likely, more of them said that they would be very likely to send their child than did parents overall. Um, and then also comparing, once again, parents who thought their child was at or ahead of grade level with parents who thought their child was behind grade level. Here too, we saw that, you know, you'd see pa the parents who thought their child needed it much more likely to say that they would participate in these programs if they were available. We also then looked at the same kind of breakdown, um, looked at it uh, between white parents and parents of color. We saw it here, this is again, exactly the same data we were just looking at in the, in the overall column. Um, but then we also see that among, particularly among black and Latino parents, we see much more interest in, um, in, in all of the items that we explored, including uh, school during vacation week, schools, uh, summer school, um, and you know, big differences also on, on tutoring. Overall, we saw, you know, if you just look at the overall ordering, it tends to be true that, that um, as a whole, parents are more interested in things that happen during um, the school, during current school days, during or after current school days, rather than during breaks or summer school. Um, but, but as you can see uh, on this chart, that's not, there, there still is more interest among, particularly among Black and Latino parents and among Asian parents looking at summer school um, than there is among white parents. But it's still less than, than um, you see uh, in terms of interest and in things that happen during school days that are already occurring. So then another big issue we've been tracking for a while now is mental health and basically concerns over mental health. And you can see here that, um, that we still have a lot of parents who express concern about their child's mental health with in this most recent way, 15% saying they remain very concerned, 29% saying that they're somewhat concerned. Um, that's down quite a bit from sort of the height um, in February 21, February of 2021, where we had 60% saying they were either very or somewhat concerned, but it's still at very high levels, very concerning levels um, <clears throat> of, uh, of uh, mental health issues for, for today's students. The other concern <clears throat> um, is that a lot of parents aren't sure sort of what's available to help their child at school. 
So the question that we asked here was, does, does your child's school have enough mental health resources uh, to offer help to students who need it? And we found 56% said yes, which in, in one sense is a majority, so that's good. But that also leaves a lot of parents, a lot of parents who are either saying no, they don't have the resources, or they don't know um, whether the school has the resources. And what's particularly concerning about that is when you look at parents who are concerned about their child's mental health, among those parents, which are represented by this pink bar right here, only 50% say yes, while thir about a third say no, and another 18% don't know. Percent don't know. So looking between the <clears throat> numbers who say they either don't have enough resources or they don't know if they do, that's half. Half of the parents who are concerned aren't sure whether or not there's enough resources in their child's school to, um, <clears throat> to help their child if they need it with mental health issues. So this is another one where we explored it in the um, <clears throat> in the uh, in the focus group and here's in the, I should say in the focus groups and here are some of the most um, compelling um, excerpts that we found from that. So um, for instance, I'll just read one out loud. I think that if kids don't feel like they belong, they're not going to learn. So for, first and foremost, they need to feel like they belong there. There's a place for them there, that they're valued and that they're valued for who they are. They can be their authentic selves. There's another one here that talks about how we more gravitate now toward physical protection, but we don't necessarily have enough counselors and staff and clinicians and so forth. So lots of very compelling um, testimonials and stories from the parents, some of whom you'll hear, hear from a little bit later in this process or in this uh, discussion. So then um, the next couple slides that we're looking at are, we asked some questions specifically just to high school parents about kind of preparing for life post high school um, and use the same sort of grading system where it was an A through F for the school for each thing. And what we found was that the highest grades went to offering enough advanced classes. That's the one you see up here at the top, 76% offered an A or a B for that. Um, we also had pretty high grades for um, helping students achieve their plans, helping them develop plans, offering opportunities to earn college credits. There's a lot who don't give A's or B's, which we should dig into more, but mostly A's and B's. Um, and then the lowest grades for helping families com helping families complete financial aid forms. Um, this one, actually, if you split it out even further into, you know, great individual grade levels, you see it go up as students, you know, progress through high school. But for, you know, ninth grade parents, it's not as perhaps not as pertinent, which is why you see so many don't know responses here. Um, so then this question kind of, bring, kind of brings it all together, and we asked whether or not you think that um, schools are adequately preparing your child for life after high school. Overall, 68% said yes. You see lots of high grades um, for the most part, but if you zero in on a couple a couple bars, I think it's just worth taking note of. One is, of, is among one of them is uh, parents of students with IEPs, where just 59% said yes to this question. And then once again, returning to parents who think that their child is currently behind grade level, they're just 36% think that, they're, um, <clears throat> that the school is uh, preparing their student adequately for life after high school. So then the next couple look at parents of students with IEPs, um, who we had a number of in the focus groups, um, and they helped us develop some of the questions and ways that we explored the, the, um, this particular topic during the survey. Um, and what this question was, was whether or not you feel like you can meaningfully contribute to decisions that will impact your child and their IEP. So this is just among parents of students with IEPs. And you can see that 84% said yes, 11% said no, the rest said don't know. Um, and that this number is actually fairly stable, though perhaps a tad lower among, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, it, it's fairly stable, uh, whether at behind or ahead of grade level. We also then asked whether or not parents think that they understand um, <clears throat> understand the requirements of their student's IEP and also whether or not the school is meeting the requirements of the IEP. Um, and we found overall, most parents think either they do understand them very or somewhat well, and the school is meeting them very or somewhat well. 
there is a debate to be had as to whether or not somewhat well is good enough in this case. You know, it is above the midpoint. So, you know, it's better than being down here, which we also see some parents down here. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, parents are fully satisfied with the way that, that things are going. And we see some of that reflected in the focus group quotes in the next slide. <clears throat> so, for instance, I understand my son's IEP, but I don't feel like they actually execute it. 100%, I understand them. They're just not being met. Um, one other dynamic we heard a lot about was parents who felt that they had to basically hold the school's feet to the fire in order to have the requirements the IEP met, that they would eventually be met, but they really had to stay on top of it, and it wasn't just sort of an autopilot situation. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So then what this one looks at is language uh, language program preferences, basically among parents of students who are ELL. We asked essentially what, pro what kind of language program their child is currently in, and then what kind of language program they would prefer if they could choose anything. Um, and the first question is represented here in this, in in this column with 61% saying that they would prefer that they currently are in, I'm sorry, an English immersion program where they learn only in English and 25% say bilingual. But then what's interesting is that you see a little bit of movement when you ask, well, what would you prefer if you could have anything with about 10 points fewer saying English immersion and 10 points more saying they would prefer bilingual um, where, the, where the child would learn in both English and um, Learns both with other other English learners only, so an interesting uh, difference there. Though still, the the larger preference remains for English immersion. So then, the final topic we dug into was safety, um, <clears throat> and we asked a few questions on this. Basically, how safe when your child is at school, how safe would you say they are from discrimination based on race and ethnicity, violence, and so forth, and found <clears throat> that overall parents believe their child is at least somewhat safe. This is another one where I think there's a debate to be had over whether or not, you know, how we should look at these pink bars, um, but, they're, but uh, the majority think that the child is at least somewhat safe from, um, from each one of these. <clears throat> But even with that said, it's worth digging in to the, the considerable number who said that they feel their child is not too safe or not at all safe um, when at school, which is what this um, what this next slide shows. So basically, these are the percent who said that they feel their child is not too safe or not at all safe from violence, uh, discrimination based on race and ethnicity and so forth. And we see overall 11% said that they they feel their child is not too or not at all safe from violence. And that number is considerably higher among Black and particularly Latino parents, where 20% say not too or not at all safe from violence. Um, and then the other one that, that stands out a bit is bullying, um, where you have 18% uh, overall and a bit less variation as far as the number of parents who think that their child is not too or not at all safe from bullying. Um, you also see a bit of variation on on discrimination based on race based on race and ethnicity, and less on discrimination on other personal factors. So then there's just a couple um, a couple quotes here, also from the focus groups. Um, the one that kind of stands out to me: if we're not creating a safe environment for students to learn in an undistracted environment, it's only going to go so far. Um, and then some other um, very poignant descriptions of some incidents that have taken place at um, the children's schools uh, of the parents that were in our focus groups. So that is what I admit is a very, very quick run through of uh, many of their poll results. As I mentioned, they are on our website at massingpolling.com. I'd encourage you to go there and look if you want more questions, more detail, more breakdowns and all that sort of thing. And do reach out if you have other questions. Um, we'd also be glad to discuss them later on during the Q&A. So Shanti, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Steve. To all, to all of you watching, feel free to leave any questions that you have in the Q&A box. It is my pleasure now to welcome our parent panelists onto the screen, who we are very grateful to have here with us today. As I mentioned earlier, they also participated in the focus groups that helped to inform the survey that you all just heard about. Today, they will share their experiences while also reflecting on the poll results. We just heard uh, Lori from Boston, Robert from Greenfield, and also Arturo from Concord. Welcome, briefly introduce yourselves, 
Uh, let's start with Lori, then Robert, and then Artur. Please share your name, the ages and grades of your children, and anything else that you would like the audience to know. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Lori Simmons. I have two children in the Boston Public School District, um, one in fourth grade and one in 11th grade. Um, my fourth grader is what you would consider to be a gen ed student, and my 11th grader is what you would consider to be a student who has an IEP. Thank you so much for sharing, Lori, um, and for also for joining us. Robert? Hi, yeah, my name is Robert Dano, and I'm from the Greenfield, Mass area, and I've got two kids in public schools, uh, seventh grade, my 13-year-old son, Tegan. And we got Savannah, who's in second grade, and she's, yeah, seven already for that. Thank you. And last but not least, Artur. Hello, uh, my name is Artur. Uh, we live in Concord. I have two kids in a local public school. Um, one is uh, eighth grader, uh, and the other one is ninth grader. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and I can't say it enough. We are truly grateful to have you all here as your perspective and experiences as parents are not only insightful, but necessary to uplift, uh, especially as state leaders create uh, plans to address the impacts of the pandemic on students. Um, now enough from me, let's jump right into the discussion. And for everyone watching, please, please drop any questions that you have um, in the Q&A as we, there will be 15 minutes to ask panelists or Steve or myself questions uh, towards the, the end of today's conversation. So I'm gonna kick it off and um, any of our pan parent panelists can feel welcome to answer the question. Um, the first question is having heard the findings from the survey data, what are your initial reactions to some of the data points you heard today? You can feel free to unmute yourself and then uh, answer the question. I see Robert that uh, you were trying to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure exactly if somebody was getting called on. But yeah, um, I thought definitely the points were with the IEPs were pretty on point for exactly what I've been dealing with and going through. Uh, it seems like this year, they're a lot more on top of things over the last three years. I'm still, I kind of took over uh, my kids schooling the last three years. So I'm still getting used to it and new to it. And my son, he has an IEP. And I took over, of course, during the middle of COVID when everything was a mess and nothing was being communicated. And this year they really jumped up. So that I was really happy with that. It seems like it's everywhere it's going on, so. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, I'm glad to know that despite the last couple of years have been uh, tough for many that uh, things seem to to be um, going in the right directions. Lori or Artur, did you guys want to share? Well, I, I have a few observations about um, uh, parents' perception of uh, school performance and their kids' performance at school. Um, regarding our school here in Concord, um, and I'm not sure exactly which metrics are used in evaluating uh, grade level performance but um last year there, there's some, there was some anecdotal evidence um, when um, middle schools were taking mcas uh they, they had uh, pretty serious issues with wi-fi so school uh, as a whole um performed substantially lower than expected so so i'm not sure if these um um observations uh, sorry data points enter uh, that um, uh, in that discussion, because parents might think that their kids perform well, but at the same time, uh, a standardized test somehow records low performance. So uh, overall, I wasn't surprised with the metrics uh, that we saw from the polling result. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing helpful context and thank you for sharing it again. Lori? Um, I don't really have much to add um, based on the data points. I mean, it's not really surprising in some areas um, when you broke it down by racial groups and as well as um, socioeconomics is kind of on par. So I don't really have much to add in that aspect because it's pretty much where I thought it would be. 
Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys all a follow up question. Uh, the first question was a little bit more broad, generally asking about the survey. As a follow up, I, I want to, I'm curious about thinking about your own child or their school. Was there anything in particular that resonated most from what you heard uh, presented from the results today? Is there anything that you, you, you heard and you were like, I, you know, I, that, I can relate to that, or that's something that I'm currently or current went through or currently am going through? Um, I think with when they talked about schools, um, two things, actually, one thing about school resources um, in terms of academic academic resources being more available. Um, that's a yes and no for me. In some ways, it's a yes, because they offer the compensatory services, but the quality of the compensatory services is laughable. So, yes, they technically are offering more, but the quantity, the quality isn't there. And then also when they talked about the social emotional aspect of it, um, I agreed that that is seriously an area that's lacking. Um, hence, you see the nationwide trend where most of these schools were having difficulties when the when most of the students came back in because the schools did not adequately prepare um, for the onslaught of um, social emotional issues that a lot of these kids had endured through the pandemic. So as a result, they're trying, I feel as though most schools are trying to play catch up in that aspect. Thank you for sharing. Um, any of our other panelists? I, I believe uh, our school system has uh, plenty of resources mm -hmm. and uh, very active in offering it to parents when it comes down to um, mental and health issues um so um i don't know due to pandemic or not but we had to reach out um uh, to guidance counselor for one of our kids and um uh, it was a great experience so uh, we can we could not complain thank you and robert i will leave it is there anything that you would like to add that hasn't been said yeah, I was just going to say that since we're on the topic of the mental health issue, I know when my son first started going to the middle school, I was kind of shocked to hear that they had already had in place a CSO kind of office built right into the school where the kids could get one on one counseling during school, after school, during the summer. Um, that was huge. Uh, my son really took to that a lot better than any other kind of counseling that, you know, he had outside of it. And so I, I've had, my experience was a little bit different than a lot of people's. My kids went into the pandemic, they had just lost their mother and we were stuck in, you know, a house for six months doing online schooling and everything. So it was kind of different for them. They were excited to go back to school. So I didn't really have, you know, too many issues with that. They wanted to go to school. They wanted to get out of the house. They wanted to see some friends and hang out. And they they have been amazing since um, the pandemic happened. They rarely miss school. They try to go to school even when they don't, you know, shouldn't be going to school probably. So, um, but I really thought at first I overlooked the aspect when I saw that CSO had their own office, had their own counselor built right in. And I was like, wow, this is what it's coming to. But then I started to, you know, we utilized it and it was amazing. And now I'm thankful for it. So I don't know how other middle schools are doing it, but I wish they had it for my daughter's elementary school almost. Um, I, I, that would have, you know, been very helpful with finding you know, the right people to connect with them. They have somebody to talk to anytime, basically during school if they need it. And that's what they're doing in Greenfield right now. I don't know about the rest of the state, but I just wanted to put that out there. 
Well, first, thank you for being so candid and I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. And I, I know it's been difficult for many and I can't even imagine how difficult it is for you. Um, but I do appreciate you highlighting bright spots. I think often we don't hear enough about the things that are actually going well, um, particularly when we talk a little bit more about mental health. Um, uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about the resource because I'm sure it's something that could be valuable to many students. Um, but thank you, thank you again. Um, so I'm gonna move us along um, to the next question. Um, so this year marked the second year of MCAS results since the beginning of the pandemic. This year's scores indicate that about 60% of third through eighth graders are not meeting grade level expectations in math and ELA statewide. However, we found that only about one in four parents see their child as behind grade level. Thinking about your own children and other parents at your children's schools, how might you explain the disconnect between exam score and parents' perceptions? Do you guys have any thought? And again, you can feel free to um, unmute if you do. All right, can you repeat that one more time, please? Of course. Thank you. Uh, so this year marked the second year of MCAS results since the beginning of the pandemic. This year's scores indicate that about 60% of third through eighth graders are not meeting grade level expectations in math and ELA st statewide. However, we found that only about one in four parents see their child as behind grade level. Thinking about your own children and other children at your chi child's school, how might you explain the disconnect between what we're seeing with exam scores and parent perceptions? Um, speaking from uh, the... <laughs> so, okay, once again, I am in Boston. Um, so between third and eighth grade, parents, just in any other state, parents have um, the option to not take MCAS, as you know. Um, there's always the opt-out um, thing. So a lot of parents, believe it or not, that I've spoken to, like my son who's in fourth grade, a lot of those parents don't really believe in the MCAS. They feel like um, the ones that I've spoken to, I should say, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't really test anything, you know, the results aren't used for anything in their eyes, like, you know, other than, you know, for state and um, whatever have you. So in terms of impact on the child itself, so you'll be surprised that a lot of parents opt out because they're like, I don't want to give my child anxiety and stress. Um, so that's part of the disconnect. Another part is that, um, my son personally is not behind grade level, but that's because um, he's in a unique situation with me in terms that I myself, I'm a parent and a teacher. So during the pandemic, he didn't have an opportunity to fall behind. Um, if anything, I kind of pushed him more because I had a more captive audience. So I think that a lot of parents just assume that um, because their kids probably somehow passed the MCAS for whatever reason, or um, once again, the grades that are given are very vague. I don't know if you know the grading system, but they use numbers, um, which doesn't really indicate anything because things, things are things like somewhat met, made it, um, made it, you know, things like that. So it's very vague. So if you are a parent and you're not really understanding it, it looks okay on the surface level. Um, but if you were to actually um, tease out how they're grading kids, how they're scoring things, and they put an actual number or letter to it, then I think a lot of parents would be surprised. Um, and that dis disillusion that they have about, oh, everybody's fine, everything is great. Everybody's back to school, I don't hear any complaints. Everything's great would probably fizzle out a little bit. Thank you for sharing. I definitely uh, brought up a question for me, but I'm going to give Artur or Robert the opportunity to jump in, and then um, I'll ask the question that you just uh, brought up a really, really good point, Lori. But uh, Artur or Robert, um, I, I can, I can. Uh, sorry. Um, so M MCAST is is very interesting to me personally because of my professional background. So whenever I get uh, letters from a local school with uh, their MCAS scores, I kind of try to analyze what's happening here, uh, break it down. Um, I'm lucky, well lucky that our kids are doing quite well at school. Um, they were always in mid expectations or above. And um, um, strangely enough for m um, one of my uh, kids, um, the, first year in 
2021 MKS, spring of 2021 MKS um, was uh, quite a bit of improvement in um, um, that kid performance. And for the other one, it was more flat. Um, but what I suspect, I, and I don't know it for sure, I just only have some anecdotal evidence. I think the rigor of education uh, in our state school system um, might have um, decreased decreased over, over time. Like um, in our middle school, they eliminated advanced math level, for instance. So um, our family chose to supplement this by some additional after school um, um, learning programs um, that will uh, give enough challenge to our children. Um, but clearly not everybody has done the same. Uh, so, so my kids improved, yet uh, we know that tests the way, the way they were conducted in 21 were not fully com comparable to the previous year tests and uh, this last spring year test. Um, so so it's, it's, um, um, it's an interesting uh, measurement uh, well, what um, we're discussing here at MCAS scores, but by itself, I think it's a little bit um, noisy, maybe uh, is the right word to describe it. Um, so, so from my personal point of view, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure. Would my kids perform better if pandemic didn't happen and uh, the school continue teaching the, uh, like it used to teach before the pandemic? Or, you know, maybe they really improved uh, because of extra effort that we put on um, during the pandemic, trying to compensate for any problems with schools. Thank you, Artur. I'm definitely going to call on you a little bit later on when we talk about additional resources, because I think you brought up a good point around not all the not every parent has you know the opportunity to to supplement um, the, some of the learning so I, uh, for their child, and I'm I'm sure I would like to, but it's not necessarily something that all can do. So I, when we talk about additional resources, definitely gonna look to you to, to build on some of the things that you shared, but uh, Robert also wanna give you the opportunity. Yeah, I was, um, when I saw that, I was kind of surprised at first because I thought the number would be higher parents knowing that, I thought there would be a much bigger number for parents that knew that their kids were behind a little bit because of the pandemic. Um, but then I kind of thought about it a little bit more thinking, you know, I was right there with my kids every single day, seeing what kind of stuff they were being taught. And it wasn't, it definitely, this area, the, the online schooling was not that great. The technology just wasn't there to get them as interactive as I think they could have been. Um, I wish I could have done more to help them myself. I'm trying to go back to school right now at the moment. Um, so I don't know if I should be the one trying to teach them. Um, and I don't, I certainly don't have the money to have them, you know, go into special tutors or anything like that. But I wish I could, if that was like, if they had more programs like that, that I could get them involved with, especially my son, who's at the, you know, sixth grade level. And I, I think that would have done done a lot better for the MCATs because when I got the scores of course I got them I had high expectation for my son with math and it didn't really look that great when I got it so I brought it in the school and said hey what's going on this is his best subject you say he's one of the best you know kids in his grade and they kind of went over with me and said yeah it's not a fair assumption of you know where he's at you know add you know this many more points to that and that's where he's actually at that's not really so I guess I'm not really sure how the how well it's gone saying and how how much they've gone down or how much they've gone up you know since the pandemic Thank you so much for sharing. And I think I heard the same from all three of you, but I definitely heard that a little bit louder from Lori in our tour around, um, you know, trying to analyze what the results mean or around the language not necessarily being something that's easy for parents to understand, right? So as a follow-up question, um, as parents, I'm curious to know, do you have any suggestions for how schools can better ensure that parents are 
uh, aware of how their students are doing um, uh, acad the, the academic challenges that they're facing and also to better understand maybe some of uh, what the test scores mean. So do you have as a parent any suggestions of how schools, again, can better ensure that parents are aware of the academic challenges? If you, I'll give you all a minute because it looks like you guys are thinking, but if nothing comes to mind, you can give me a sign and I will uh, move on to the next question. I'll, I'll go for a second. Mine was a kind of a short answer of this one is I just noticed, like I said, just a few years ago, I started being a lot more involved. Before I did a lot of assuming if I didn't hear anything, I thought they were doing good. It wasn't until I started getting more involved, going to the parent-teacher conferences, communicating with the teachers just I had to kind of take it upon myself to get out and get into the school to really get a gist of what was going on and where they really were you know before I would have thought you know quiet means good it means they're doing good and it wasn't the case that's really helpful and I think um definitely the relationship between um schools and, and families is really important um, I heard a lot about you had to take it upon yourself. So I think it's important to note that it's important for um, the school to feel welcoming to all the parents so that more, more parents could uh, feel more comfortable also uh, engaging. Um, but Lori and Artur, anything um, you would like to add? I was going to say like in public education, some a trend that I've seen is, I mean, because most public schools, you know, there's a a vast number of students. So it is that squeaky wheel type mentality. As a parent, if you are not visible and if you are not making yourself be, be heard, um, or unless your child is like one of those kids that's, you know, not the nicest kid in the class. But if you're, you know, if you have an average kid who goes in, you know, sits down, does what they're supposed to do, and they're for the most part, they're an okay student, you're not really going to get a lot of information from the school per se, you'll get the baseline information, well, you know, they pass, they didn't pass, whatever the case may be. But if, you know, like um, Robert said, you have to be very present and visible in order to get, I feel, that level of um, communication that you want. So I am a very vocal parent. Um, I, I'm gonna just share a little, when they see me come into my son's IEP meeting, nobody's smiling because they're like, oh man, we're in for a long haul because I'm gonna go point for point. But that's me um, because I have seen and heard stories of the school kind of just running through the motions, the parents not fully understanding and then sign here. And then that's it. Um, and then, you know, a few months later, their kid may be having difficulties and people are like, what happened? You know, so I feel and I, and I think that that needs to change in some ways is that in order for you to continuously get that information, support, um, information, whatever have you, you as a parent have to constantly make your presence be known. And I get it, it does take a good communication between the school and the home. But I feel as though as parents, at least for me, and it sounds like Robert as well, you got to do a little bit more than just, you know, yeah, you go to the parent teacher conferences and things like that. But it's like you got to sometimes send an email, make a phone call, do these extra check ins, because if you don't, you kind of like, you kind of like get blended into the crowd of students, and your kid just becomes another person in the class really 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 insightful I, I um I know schools are dealing with it a lot but I, I I also recognize that um in in being a part of the focus group that's something that came up a lot feeling like if you know as a parent you have to go that extra mile or or you uh as parents highlighting really the need to improve communications and engagement um so I I definitely appreciate that coming up today and our, our tour just want to uh give in the closing remarks to you yeah uh really short um answer here because um we were not really uh in a position to receive uh any communication from school about um the challenging challenges our children face um However, you know, they regularly send us emails uh, about, you know, there's upcoming test, make sure your kid studies, you know, this is a topic we're going to cover. So, you know, parents just need to be on top of those to um, make sure they don't miss those. Um, 
but um, it's hard for me to to judge uh, if the the parents with students who are um, struggling getting some additional communications. I, I just don't know about it. Okay, thank you. Um, that's also helpful um, to know um, as well. So I really appreciate your your honesty. Um, I know that this came up a little bit in the beginning, so I want to probe a little bit um, um, more. Um, we saw that parents who see their child as behind grade level are more likely to also report mental health and safety concerns uh, and overall give their schools lower grades on almost every issue. Uh, so my question is thinking about your own children and other children they know, does mental health seem more of a concern uh, this school year or about the same as it's always been? Uh, maybe I can start. Um, I don't know about, um, so I, I wouldn't be able to, to talk about my kids or their friends, or, uh, but overall um, in the school system, we did get communication that uh, about some behavioral issues. And um, in the last year, maybe two, um, and it's clearly related to pandemic and remote learning. So uh, it probably wouldn't be avoidable um, after having such crisis uh, like we experienced in 2020. So, so that's the only thing um, that uh, I would be aware of. Perhaps other parents can say some more. And do you feel like it's it was about the same as it was maybe the last two years, or or you think it's uh, it's I more? I think the the administration acknowledged there was an increase in uh, um, some, you know, um, issues uh, with school kids' behavior, stuff like that. Thank you. I mean, for me personally, um, when I think about my son who who um, does have challenges, I his school hasn't really. I mean, they've had their challenges like every other school because. I don't think there's, I don't, maybe there exists, but I don't really know too many schools, at least around the city where they've came back and everything was wonderful. Every single school around the city has had their set of challenges, whether it's public charter, whatever have you. Um, I know that um, technology and social media has played a tremendous role in that um, because there's a lot of issues with you know, the phones in school and the kids' attention because they spent so much time at home. They spent a lot of time on their phones and on social media. So that impacts now they're, you know, you're telling them to put that away, focus on me. I'm teaching you, I'm here. And they're like, mm, no, I want to still be able to check my Instagram and my Snapchat and whatever have you. Um, so that leads to some of the behavior. But in terms of their mental health, there there is some issues. Um, I. I can't necessarily speak to those on in my children's schools, but I know that in other schools around the city, um, there is an increase in bullying. The, the way that students are engaging with each other, because once again, they were looking at each other from behind the screen for almost over a year. And now that they're face to face, they're, the filters have seemed to have been erased. So a lot of things are coming out of these kids' mouths and it's a lot of it's not nice. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these kids are really being affected by that, you know, um, by harsh criticism, by uh, inappropriate language, um, you know, things like that. So in terms of an uptick in their social and emotional health, absolutely, um, at least around the city, that was a huge issue um, when we first got back, you know, physically into the building. Uh, it's somewhat tapered a little bit, but it is way above where we were prior to the pandemic. That's uh, really un unfortunate to, to hear that there's been an, an, an uptick in, you know, behavioral challenges and also, you know, uh, directly affecting students' mental health definitely um, underscores the importance of when we talk about additional resources to really focus on, on mental health and how we can support um, students and, and educators as well to be able to, to um, thrive. Uh, Robert? Yeah, uh, 
So, like I said, I'm in a much different situation. Um, I haven't seen anything going on with bullying with my kids or anything. Um, I feel like Greenfield does a pretty good job. They're almost too fast to jump at it. I know there was an incident with my son, which I was like, normally he's totally anti-bullying. He's the one who wants to step in and help whoever's being bullied. He's done it numerous times at some of the camps he's been to. He's very much pro like helping kids. And I got a call one day where they thought he was bullying a kid, but it they were just too fast to judge. It was a confrontation. They had them playing a game against each other. And he got he tends to get very frustrated when he's playing video games. Anything competition wise, he gets very passionate and gets overwhelming and will start to he's got that kind of you know, attack mode on, and it was, it wasn't bullying, it was just a uh, kind of a blow up, a miscommunication, and, um, but out of all of his friends, I really don't hear anything about bullying going on, they seem to be connecting a lot better, um, so I'm lucky at that, in that aspect, I think it's, it is a unique situation at that school, the way they're handling things and bullying. They are, I feel like they're just going above and beyond to counteract any bullying. So I'm gonna actually build off. I've heard a lot of uh, positive comments around resources or how schools are supporting students around mental health, uh, Robert. So I'm, as I mentioned earlier, gonna look to you, but just curious uh, in general, uh, these findings indicate that students' academic affect other aspects of their school experience. Um, so as a parent, do you have any suggestions for how schools can ensure that all aspects of students are supported? <clears throat> no, I, I guess I'd be kind of on them, like, and maybe talk to them more see what they're feeling seeing what's making you know like I said with having CSO there they do a lot of the problem solving of any issues going on at school so I almost don't really hear that too much about it they have their own little world in there and it seems to be going good so I'm That's not really sure what else I could add to it no, that's good feedback. I remember in the uh, that some of the parents elevated in the focus groups around, you know, sometimes uh, like the school, uh, the staff in the school are busy. Sometimes, um, you know, are are sort of tending to things that are going on in the school. But I'm hearing from their child how much uh, how how much of a long way is a, a hello or an acknowledging or having a conversation what a child can really make to their for their day. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to start with a big uh, initiative. Starting small is also uh, an approach. So I appreciate you elevating that, um, Lori or Artur. Uh, anything that you would like to to make sure that we capture, Lori? Um, I think that something that's kind of is a little bit lost is the making connections with their students. Um, I get it. Teachers have a lot of students. They teach so many kids in one given day and they have so much to do. But I think that to make that extra effort to know these kids, um, to, you know, get a better understanding. So like, you know, listening to Robert, had his teacher, you know, thought, had known a little bit more about his son, he might've said, you know what? He has a competitive streak. So, you know, he was just really involved in the game. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was just, his competitive streak came out and he wanted to win it, you know, at all costs because that's who he is as a child. So, you know, knowing something like that about him might have staved off that initial, um, you know, uh, assumption about him. So I think that making connections with the students and really trying to get to know a little bit more than beyond the surface. So I know that not all kids are going to open up. So, but the ones that are willing to make those connections, make those, you know, um, get to know them a little bit better beyond just my name is such and such. I live here and I have this many kids, you know, brothers and sisters and I have a pet, you know, asking them something unique about themselves and kind of observing them and seeing what they like and what they don't like. Just being a little bit more intuitive about who's in front of them each day. That's that goes a long way, I think, because when you can say, you know what, like, 
I see you like anime because you're always in these t-shirts. Like, what's your favorite one? Which one do you watch? You know, something like that. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's right. I like blah, blah, you know, something like that. If you pick up on the smallest thing for a kid and they see that, they're more inclined to open up to you, have a conversation and um, build a better relationship with you. I uh, love to hear it. I mean, if those things matter for, as an adult, I like to hear those things so, um, and make connections with some of my colleagues or friends. I'm, I'm sure that that can go really a long way for, for students who engage with, with teachers and staff in, day in and day out. So I, I appreciate the sentiment from both you, Lori, and from Robert. Artur, um, anything that you would like to add? No, no excuse me, not really. Uh, I whole, wholeheartedly agree with Lori uh, here. Um, uh, I think she made a wonderful comment. I, uh, I don't know um, exactly what's happening in our school. I'm pretty sure uh, teachers are pretty much on top of uh, any um, um, uh, any time that they need to get involved. Um, but um, I agree. You know, the, the more that connection is between teachers and children, uh, the better it is. The sooner it will get addressed. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that, that that connection was always important. But I think given the last couple of years where many students were, were at home and weren't necessarily maybe interacting with the teachers or other students, that's um, especially more important. So I, I appreciate you all for bringing that up. Um, so the next question that I have was in the poll, we asked parents which type of additional academic resources or supports would be most helpful for school to provide students. We found that parents' interest level varied by demographic. So how can schools and districts best engage families in decision-making to ensure that the resources meet the community needs? Right, so the, the needs of every community is not gonna look the same. Um, it's always important to take things into account when it, when it you know, if, what time of the year that the resources is, is going to be offered. Um, in certain communities, is transportation going to be accessible for families? So keeping those things in mind, um, what can schools do to make, make sure that they best engage families in decision-making so that again, that it's not just an initiative, but that it really works for the community's needs. So you're saying what type of resources that, is that the question? The question is, how can schools best engage families? How best can they engage? So how families? can they make sure that families have a seat at the table when those decisions around which academic resources um, are, are going to best meet the needs of the community? And it can be maybe sharing something that has, has worked uh, maybe in your school or something that you've heard from a colleague. Like, for example, is a sending a survey, a blast survey um, out to families, uh, the best way maybe to, to gather their input. Uh, like, what are some um, maybe recommendations that you have for how uh, districts can best engage? Families? I mean, in all honesty, for the most part, schools do try. I see that, you know, surveys are sent home, you know, they have the uh, school pack meetings, they have parent, you know, councils, they have all of these different ways that parents could engage. But, you know, unfortunately, um, at least within and around the city, they're not very well attended for different reasons. Like you said, a lot of it is childcare, transportation, whatever have you. Even on Zoom, it's, you know, parents work all these crazy different hours. Um, and I think that it is important for parents to utilize these opportunities, but I mean, I really do feel like the schools do really try. It's just that the parents, not all parents um, are making it a priority. And, you know, I used to, <laughs> I had this crazy idea once upon a time uh, years ago and I, I was frustrated by, you know, watching these low attendance for like, open houses and parent teacher conferences and school committee meetings I'm like you know what we should make it mandatory and if they don't show up they should have to pay a fine that's unrealistic I know but in all honesty at least from where I'm sitting and the parents involvement that I see around me with the schools doing all kinds of events you know they have family nights they have yoga night they have all kinds of things to like entice the parents to be a part of the community I'm like in all honesty the only time that you can get a lot of these parents to pay attention is when it financially affects them and they can't afford for it to financially affect them because the first thing that says I have to go to work I have to make money well you know what if you don't show up you have to pay a fine I know that that's never going to happen but 
something with that extremity put to it is the only thing I feel sometimes that's going to get through to a lot of these parents and make them say, you know what, I got to show up. I know I have to go to work or I know I'm tired, but if I don't go, you know, I'm going to get fined or something, or I'm going to lose some privilege or whatever it may be, but there has to be some type of important consequence put on it so that parents pay attention more. Because the schools um, are trying. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that, uh, that's uh, really helpful. Um, uh, contact. I, 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 I and then, and again, just uh, building off of some of the things that we heard. I think that there are a lot of schools are are trying. Um, there, of course, there's always opportunity to try new or different approaches. Um, also have to think about uh, what the relationship going back to what we said before what the relationship is like because I think even if there are a lot of opportunities available um, making sure that you know they feel welcomed within the school because if you don't feel welcomed even if there's 40 opportunities you may not uh, feel as inclined to, to participate so I think it's 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 a lot to consider but I, I really appreciate you bringing that up um, again you don't have to uh, if you don't have anything that you would want to add that's okay but definitely want to um, give you the opportunity our uh, tour or Robert I, I, I can just say that uh, Lori is 100% correct. Uh, it, a lot of it is, a, it is on parents. Um, luckily for us, um, our town has very strong parent teacher associations uh, at each uh, school level, elementary, middle school, high school, and they're very active and they very clo work very closely with teachers. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Um, um, uh, I, but there are, you know, sometimes downsides, like when we got that letter, and uh, I believe it was uh, 2020 fall season when the, they would eliminate like um, advanced level of math in middle school. Um, that was a disappointment. On the other hand, we were going through pandemic and schools could just were trying to do the best they could at this moment, uh, trying to have in, in person uh, teaching, um, so so it was, it was, um, and and also we had a half and half system. So uh, half of the day, uh, subset of one subset of students was there, and the other half the other. So um, um, it was very challenging for for teachers, and I understood why that decision was made, but um, uh, they did not ask the parents how they would feel about it, um, and clearly. Uh, some people like myself probably were disappointed, but, you know, they were just trying to do their best in this challenging environment. So, um, yeah. Thank, well, thank you. I definitely heard from you that while you you understand the challenges that, that schools were um, facing and why it happened, but definitely maybe an opportunity to at least have that conversation around the why and, and give parents the opportunity to ask questions. So so that is uh, a really helpful to maybe not just make decisions, but also allow opportunities um, for, for weigh-in. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, Robert? Yeah. Um, yeah, our town, they did a, a big thing where they had a vote and they had a lot of meetings to discuss what they were going to do with everything. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. That's the only thing I kind of regret that I didn't do. I tried to say yes to everything that the school asked, where I can participate, where I can be there to help, you know, get in there and just meet all the teachers and see where I can help the best. I think it's like, like what Lori said, it's like building a it's kind of like building a community for the kids to help surround them with the best possible education they can. I know how to help my son because me and him were like twins. Like I, he has the same struggles I had in school that I wasn't able to articulate when I was younger to be telling them what's wrong, what I needed help with. So I, I got overlooked completely a hundred percent. And it did not work for me but now because I got up got motivated went in there and connected with the teachers and was able to really show them who my son was it helped everybody especially him he's tremendous even in his his biggest you know hardship and mine was was always like ELA and now he's going out at 
13 years, well, he's been doing it since he was 11, going out and doing public readings where he'll read in front of people. I would have never done that. I would have, that would have stayed long and far away from that. And my teachers had no passion at all to help me, you know, get better. Um, so it's definitely changed for the best from, because I went to the same exact school he is. And I was pleasantly surprised at how much better, you know, the, the, teachers were and how compassionate they were and how motivated they wanted to actually help the students. I remember one teacher when I was growing up, my fourth grade teacher, I still remember on my, and I don't remember any of my elementary school teachers at all, but I remember this guy because he was so passionate about each and every student. And it was the first time I wanted to try. And he's been like, my son has been like that for the last two years since he's been going back to school since the pandemic. He sees teachers that want to help him and he has me backing it up. And I think he sees that and it helps, you know, push him to get better. Thank you. And I, and I love to see how much of an, an advocate you are, of course, for your child and of course, all of mm -hmm. you for being here today and, and sharing um, what could be done to what should continue, what could be done to Im improve schools. Um, and I appreciate that we're ending on such a positive note, right? I think that we all can can name a, a teacher that impacted us and, and, and a teacher that um, comes to mind. I, I certainly can, but I won't share because we don't have um, time. Unfortunately, uh, I had more questions. I would have loved to spend more time hearing from all of you, um, but we are nearing the end. Um, so Lori, Robert, and Artur, I, I sincerely want to thank you so much for taking the time to be here today um, and for sharing your experiences and, and perspectives. But as we said earlier, as we're getting closer to the end of our time here today, I really want to save some time for our audience questions, uh, which have been filling up in the chat. Uh, so please stay on, on your uh, screen, um, given that some of the questions might be for you. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Steve to please join us again. Okay, so uh, with the remaining of our time, we will dig into the questions. The first question is, are there any specific subjects where you would grade your child's school differently than the overall grade you would give the, would give the school, either positively or negatively? And I think maybe if this is helpful, I'll try to give some context. Again, this was a question that was asked, but I think it might be um, getting at, um, if you remember from the poll, really about the grades that their parents uh, gave the, the school. Um, so so uh, there were specific categories around like uh, how they're doing providing mental health support, how they're doing to maybe recruit teachers of color, how they're doing to, um, so, I guess maybe the question is geared toward that. So is there any specific uh, category, I guess, rather than subject, you would grade your child's school differently than overall? So if overall you gave your child's school, like overall I give them an A for how they're doing, but I'll give them a C here. This is an area that they can improve. And again, this is just my interpretation of the question, but I hope I did uh, the person who asked the question justice. Um, I, I think that I don't know, I might just be overthinking this, but I feel like that's more of a high school question. Um, middle school, I think, I, I think all of them uh, are overall well-rounded. I don't see any, you know, you know, certain classes where they can improve or that need more attention. It seems like all of them Every time I go to the school, all the teachers come out and I get to speak with all of them. They're all equally as intent to making the best effort at, you know, my son's education, if I answered that correctly. There's no uh, wrong or right answer. We just appreciate you uh, uh, sharing. Um, I can say this um, for my son who's in high school, who has an IEP. Um, prior prior to coming out of the pandemic and shortly after coming out, the communication from his previous school um, 
was awesome. The surround, uh, the people that were surrounding him in terms of making sure that, um, you know, he was able to um, access his class. So for example, when he was coming out of eighth, he, during the pandemic, when we, he was transitioning into high school and they offered him, offered us the opportunity to come into the school and for my son to get his schedule and walk the building to figure out where his classes were mm. um, so that when, you know, all the kids came back in, he wouldn't be, you know, disoriented and confused. So, you know, that to me was going above and beyond that they offered that to him. And, you know, I appreciated that support from the um, special education department. So, you know, they were very much on making sure that I got updates from the teachers weekly and things like that. So um, in the beginning, they were phenomenal with, with the level of communication and the communicate, um, the amount of help you know, assistance they provided him with navigating, you know, being in a larger school and a bigger environment. So for that, I would grade them in that aspect higher than I would the overall academics. Mm, really helpful to know. Really helpful. I appreciate you sharing. I, honestly, for me, it would be very hard to judge um, in what areas uh, school schools should have been um, uh, better um, or worse um what uh, my personal observation is uh, when pandemic happened schools were very proactive keeping kids separate uh making sure there's no transmission among them etc cetera, etc cetera. and my my children were transitioning from elementary school to middle school and um that um uh, they assign into several cohorts like uh, a middle school class like sixth grade is divided into you know three or four um subsets and then uh, because of pandemic the kids mingled much less uh across these cohorts so in my view that could, that could have been an effect on uh, formation of friendships and uh, their social life but i don't know um you know they they had that process in the past too so maybe pandemic made it worse uh maybe there's a, this is the area where things could improve but now you know we're back to the you know maskless and everybody's mingling again but um i still don't know maybe my kids were because they did not get as many friends early in early years when pandemic just started maybe that kind of went on further so um other than that, it's very hard to draw any distinction uh, how schools can be graded differently in various subjects. Thank you for sharing, um, Robert. Okay, you'll pass. I think I'm or I had already. Oh, I think okay. it's the first one to talk. So we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to try to get into questions. So if um, you uh, want want to respond, um, if not, that's okay as well. Um, so the, the first question that I'm going to try to get with the couple minutes we have is, are there any other resources you wish your child had access to? Or is there a resource or support your child got this year that you would want to stay? Okay, maybe I'm gonna read the room. Oh, Robert? Uh, yeah, I'd say one thing is like, during the pandemic, we saw, you know, a lot of online schooling. I wish they could figure out a different system um, where they can entwine. I heard a lot in the last meetings we had in the polls that there was a lot of schools doing almost kind of half online learning, half in-school learning to help maybe catch up. I, I think that would be a good integration into our school because they really weren't, like I said before, weren't on top of the online learning. We didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. And I feel like if they added a little bit extra to where they could do something outside of school, I, I think that would help improve and help them catch up. 
that's helpful because I, I definitely remember that as well. I think you're bringing up a point of like using that as a way to help students catch up. But I also heard uh, in the focus group that while some students struggled uh, with online or being more on the computer, some students really thrived um, being able to, to, to be online. So definitely um, helpful to know that uh, schools maybe should be thinking about uh, ways to incorporate some of the um, online or um, electronic aspects. Um, Lori or Tor, anything you'd like to add? And if you are good and don't have anything, just give me a thumbs up. Okay. So the last question that I'm, and I'm gonna, I saved this one to end uh, and hopefully a bright, uh, a bright uh, point. Uh, what hopes do you have for your child or children for the remainder of this school year? And it could be maybe something about the school or maybe something personally for your child. Like, I hope they read five books by the end of the school year. I don't know, uh, uh, hopes that you would like to share. Um, well, the school has agreed to um, give my son additional reading support outside of the school. Um, so I'm very hopeful of that and that um, having a organization that it is completely just focused on nothing but literacy will um, benefit him and that he will make some serious gains. I'm very happy to hear that he's going to get that additional support. And I hope that um, I'm able to connect with you in the future to learn a little bit more about how that's going. Artur, Robert? Uh, I, <clears throat> uh, my older child started uh, high school this year and um, uh, it was a very uh, good experience on one hand, but stressful, of course, it's, it's a new school. Uh, and I just wish, um, um, you know, uh, my, ch my child continues that way uh, in, the, in the high school. And my younger child who finishes middle school this year, um, again, doing great. I just I hope that uh, they do just as, as, as well for the rest of the year. And this is about school performance. They also do sports, dance, and other things, and uh, very happy um, uh, to the point where I feel guilty of uh, making them do all that stuff. Yeah, I just hope they continue. Um, I love to see how you lit up talking uh, about uh, your your child's futures endeavor and definitely big going into high school, not only going to a new school, but being into a school with older kids is definitely Back in the day, I remember that being something as well that I was, you know, a little anxious about. So I, I hope it goes well, both for your uh, child that's going to go into the middle school and for the child that's already in high school. Robert, you will uh, sort of end. So uh, let us know what you're hopeful for. Yeah, um, I'm going to say I'm pretty confident in, you know, he's doing really good. So I kind of want to do a hopeful for myself that I can, you know, find something that I can help benefit both of them and help bring them to the next level. My daughter, she's doing awesome. She, her first year was online in kindergarten and that was almost basically nothing. And she was able to catch up really quick the next year at the younger age. I think that, I think that was more common. So yeah, I have no, no worries about them. I think they're going strong and going in an upward way so I just want to work on myself to try to help better them and you know we got a lot of and they're both in sports too that's why I want to apologize why I kept going to the door my son has basketball practice tonight every day in the last two weeks they one of the other had basketball practice every single day so I was trying to get my son picked up that's why so I did please want to apologize. Do, please that. do not, please do not apologize at all. We uh, truly appreciate you being here, taking time away from uh, seeing your child play basketball to be here with us tonight. Uh, so please do not apologize. But uh, thank you so much for sharing. I'm, I'm smiling myself. You guys make me want to hug my one year old a little tighter after this meeting. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you, you guys um, sharing and uh, especially appreciate it. Like I said, um, this last question. But uh, this is all the time that we have. Um, for tonight. Um, 
Thank you all for joining us. Uh, keep an eye out for future events like this. Uh, the Massing Polling Group and, uh, has and, and will continue to put out meaningful uh, finding on Massachusetts residents. Um, and there will also be uh, future upcoming uh, parent education polls, which would again, will collaborate with parents um, to co-create the questions. We'll listen in the focus groups and um, also have um, a parent uh, focus event like we did tonight uh, and, and if you miss any of tonight's um, event or want to share with others it is being recorded uh, and will be available uh, at the mass ink polling group uh, dot com uh, and uh, any of the details with the poll and uh, Juan, uh Steve said this earlier today but also want to give again uh, thank you to the bar foundation for um, sponsoring the poll and to the audience thank you so much for watching and I truly hope that you guys have a good rest of your week and a good night thank you Thank you.